In this episode of Investors and Operators, I sit down with Glenn Oaken, co-founder and managing director of Mangrove Equity Partners, a Florida-based lower middle market private equity firm founded in 2006. Glenn, thanks for joining. I want to start off with maybe some warm-up questions, kind of get the gears to- turning and do a lightning round uh, of questions here. The first okay. and perhaps most important question is, what is your theme song or music genre? I do not You'll have walk a theme out song. song. Right. Don't have a theme <laughs> song, but my, my musical tastes go pretty far and wide, pretty schizophrenic. Um, but I'd have to say, if I had to pick a couple, I'd say... Being a dinosaur, I'd say James Taylor, you've got a friend, or that's why I'm here. Same thing. There we go. Next question, childhood hero. Pretty much like a lot of uh, young guys, a uh, big sports freak uh, growing up. So I would have to say, again, this dates me, but Carl Yastrzemski or Bobby Orr. All right. I will smile and nod. <laughs> <laughs> Very diplomatic of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Favorite quote. Um, I am guilty of repeating ad nauseum, especially with my team, uh, something that's, it's not eloquent, but it is ain't no dress rehearsal. And that just means that we got to make the most of and enjoy every day. We might be diving deep into that <laughs> later on. And the last question is, what is your favorite book? In print or on Audible, both are acceptable. Okay, uh, that, that would be impossible um, because I do love to read. Um, I love to read a breadth of, on, on a breadth of topics, material. Uh, and I, I love to, to work that into my discussions with people, find out what they're impassioned about, what their interests are. And to the extent that I read something that's relevant, you know, have a discussion, occasionally turn them on to a great tome that is uh, in, involved in something or it's about something that they, they really are excited about. Um, literally this morning, I was talking to a very bright guy who studied and taught um, mathematics, philosophy, physics, and uh, we were talking about Stephen Hawking's history, a brief history of time, for example. Yeah. So there's all, I'm happy to have a, a lot of arrows in that quiver. So you just like to read kind of a, a wide variety of material, and it's interesting because it's, what does that come from? Uh, just intellectual curiosity, just being interested in a lot of different things. Uh, short attention span, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I listen to my Audible on 1.25. Like, no, I, 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 I just story. <laughs> generally, genuinely interested in a lot of different things. And, and it's wonderful because I can dive into what people are excited about and interested in and hopefully have an interesting conversation if they're readers. Well, let's rewind a little bit. And I, I've, I mean, obviously we were on part one and part two together of the Legends of BD webinars, um, but I don't really know your story and I don't know much about you. So <laughs> I really want to take this opportunity just to kind of rewind a little bit and learn, you know, your backstory, where are you from and, you know, what do you think are some of the most formative parts about your upbringing, uh, good and bad, and just kind of how you navigated that? Sure. Um, well, I grew up like, I guess, most people in, in a way. I grew up in, in the city in Boston, the youngest of six kids. Um, my parents were academics. My father was a, a professor. Uh, subscript poverty. <laughs> so <laughs> with, with six kids in the city, um, you know, we had an emphasis in the family of, you know, hard work, self-reliance, um, you know, in, intellectual rigor or academic, you know, rigor. Um, but what did your dad teach? Um, he, he was a research scientist and taught medicine. Okay. Uh, but and my mother taught nursing, but, and there was a, a, a big sort of humanist vein in, in their example as well. Um, so it was more about, you know, becoming accomplished, but not in uh, an economic sense necessarily. It was about doing a good job and, and helping other people, um, which was a beautiful way to grow up, especially around, you know, five terrific siblings um, who were, Drinking the same Kool Aid. <laughs> Wait, hold on a second. I missed that. Five sil- siblings? Yeah. So I, I'm one of six, um, which was just wonderful. Uh, everyone different from each other, kind of learn how to get along with a, a diversity of, of people, which is probably going to be a common theme in our discussion, I'm going to guess, today. 
Uh, but you know, it, it made us uh, great lessons. It made us uh, hardworking, and it made us extremely grateful for everything that uh, that came our way. What um? So after Boston, where'd you move to next? Like, what's the kind of the the journey? Yeah, there, there was actually a sort of a, a, a formative shift there. There was a family move to, uh, I'll say, from you know, a fairly rough neighborhood um, in Jamaica Plain at the time in Boston to uh, a very genteel uh, place culturally in Richmond, Virginia. And it, it was wonderful to see two sides um, of, of culture, basically. Uh, and, and both, um, you know, I think had their benefits in terms of an upbringing. You know, gr growing up, I mean, with six kids, uh, were you kind of helping your parents out on academic papers or like, uh, did, did you have any, you know, jobs growing up or you know, like, first off, where'd you go to college? And like, what's that story of, you know, sure. yeah, um, gr growing up, maybe jobs. What was, your first, what was your first job? Always had jobs. First job was probably around seven shoveling snow. <laughs> ridiculously big snows. Uh, uh, in in Boston for for neighbors, um, but always always worked always always had jobs. Um, in fact, one of the interview questions I love to ask people is, "Tell me about the crappiest job you ever had." <laughs> and while people like like our kids can be incredibly hardworking, um, and in and, and, and academics, so they're they're not working to you know be able to afford something. They're, they're uh, not working for the economics of it. Um, you know, I, I, I do enjoy hearing about you know, people's youth and, you know, what they endured and, and what they, when, when and how they did what they had to do and worked hard. What are some of those stories for you? Um, geez, it's a pretty long list. Uh, I uh, insulated tobacco warehouses in the summer in Virginia, uh, 135 degrees surface temperature and, and the very tall metal roofs. Um, I've bounced at a liquor lounge. I've driven a truck. Um, very glamorous. <laughs> <But> <laughs> one of my uh, co-founders, uh, one of his lovely jobs was he worked uh, a paving crew in the summer in Florida. And yes, he is a very hardworking guy. What, um, I guess we'll come back to that later on, on Mangrove and just like the, the culture, but you know, what, what do you think are some of the biggest lessons that you got from maybe one of those jobs or, you know, that set of pre private equity careers or slash jobs? Yeah. I, I don't want to become a broken record on this point, but working those types of jobs, I mean, you definitely do um, get exposed to, and you can get to work with and you get to befriend an incredible breadth of types of people from different backgrounds. Um, and not just people that are privileged, you really get to, to appreciate um, people broadly and learn how it's to work with them, how to get along with them. It's interesting because um, in college, after my uh, father passed, I had to find my own way to pay for college. And it was interesting just working at Outback Steakhouse, you know, as a waiter, plus working at a software company, plus going to college. <laughs> and yeah. You know, in, in retrospect, that was one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. Just it gave me such a, a depth of appreciation for every type of job, yeah. you know, from being a busboy and starting off that way right. to being a waiter and, you know, having a service mentality. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And, and I, um, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but... You know, when we, we're partnering with companies, um, the people at the top are incredibly important. But so are the people that are working on the plant floor. And so culturally as a team, uh, I know that everybody in our team has a great deal of respect, um, sort of the sanctity of, of hard work and, and of people in general. Well, maybe leading up to Mangrove, like what was your first job out of college? When did you graduate? What was the first yeah. year job out of college? And, you know, what is the path that you've taken? Sure. Um, got out in uh, 84 and was making a bit of a shift away from the family business, if you will. I had concentrated in studies and, and sciences and I had an English major and had taken, you know, business related coursework at the University of Virginia, but uh, I wasn't in the undergraduate business school. 
So arguably I was making a pivot and um, got a job uh, to get some just basic business and, um, and finance uh, training. And it was a bank training program and it was down in Tampa. So happily I was here um, and we're still here. So I obviously like it down here. Um, but it was, it was very, very good training. And then subsequent to that, um, went to work uh, at an investment bank um, and uh, worked in, in derivatives area briefly. Uh, and then private equity in, in our 20s. What was the, what was that experience like in banking? And, you know, what was that experience like there? And, you know, before we go to the next step. Yeah, it, it was wonderful um, because one, for the first time in my life, I actually had enough money to maybe spend a hundred dollars in a weekend. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> that was great. I was actually getting paid. Uh, given the past, that was I was refreshing and, and happy. Um, but it was a it was a fraternity slash sorority. It was you know like everyone's first job. I hope it was a group of of excited, you know, uh, fun, interesting, bright young people. So that was a blast. Really, then, it was good. Good background. So, how'd you make that change over to, you know, switching over to private equity? What was like the next steps? Well, I, I, I worked in um, uh, at an investment bank, um, uh, but not in investment banking, not in M and A. Um, but that was that was helpful from an education standpoint. Uh, and then, um, in the crash of '87, um, that investment bank. Uh, suffered some and uh, they, they right sized. So they were kind of reeling. So I, uh, I had written a business plan and I took it up to Chemical Venture Partners in New York. And I knew John Kirtley, who had think, two years under his belt at, uh, at Chemical, um, and um, got to share that plan with those, uh, with, with those guys. Uh, unbeknownst to me, John and one of one of his colleagues, Jeff Black, were planning on leaving Chemical as they went up market. They were growing in fund size, and of course, it was a classic story for you know private equity. They were going up in deal size. They no longer were interested in in lower middle market companies. You know, two to six million of EBITDA, say, or you know, two to eight. Uh, leaving that um, that size open. Uh, and it was pretty open, I think, from an industry-wide standpoint. If you could figure out how to do deals and you could garner any, any cap, uh, captive capital, people tended to go with market, of course, and they still do. Um, so I was fortunate that those guys were um, planning on leaving um, and planning on, on focusing on lower middle market deals. So I was, I was very fortunate to hook up with John and Jeff, and, and that's um, how FCP got started. Florida Capital Partners got started. You, so you just wrote a business plan when you're in, in, how old were you? Let's, uh, uh, let's open that up a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, d- directionally, oh gosh, 25 years old. Um, and uh, it, it was just a, a very happy happenstance that it put me in, in front of those guys. And once I found out what private equity was and what it was about, um, and I think Kurtley came out of the womb knowing uh, what private equity was and that he really was going to do it. Uh, once I, I found out about private equity, I just categorically knew this is exactly what I want to do. This is very exciting. And uh, I was very fortunate to get to, uh, to enter it at a young age and, and when the industry was young. So the next step was starting FCP. And yeah. what, uh, how, how long w- were you... Um, was that going and just like, what was that experience like? Yeah, we started in 1989. Chemical Venture Partners was our sole limited partner and, and trusted, uh, you know, three kids essentially um, without a lot of experience, uh, which was wonderful of them, um, with just enough capital to do a couple of deals. And they went quite well and it, it, it grew very quickly from there. And we still stayed small and, and still to this day, you know, mangrove is small, um, but it went quite well. And uh, we were able to raise a more traditional uh, fund or funds thereafter, a total of six at Florida Capital Partners um, from diversified, um, you know, more typical uh, limited partner base. Um, what was it like on your first deal? <laughs> well, the first deal, I, I can, I can um, 
I, I can address that probably more interestingly by just sort of sharing a little bit about what it was like in general, you know, to, to show up um, with the wrong wardrobe probably because being respectful, of course, and being in our 20s and, and visiting with someone that was a very accomplished entrepreneur, maybe in their 70s, you know, we would, we would suit up, right? You go in there and uh, depending on the industry, it was not the right move. And I think we, we worked pretty quickly there. But th there was an element, at least in our minds, um, walking in the door, 70 some odd year old entrepreneur looking at you know, people in their early to mid twenties and saying, what are you doing here? <laughs> um, but I, th I think pretty quickly, if you evidence that you know, you know what you're doing and you, you, you are respectful and you gain people's trust and their friendship, um, all's forgiven. At least it seemed that way because we, we did make, make some good hay over those six months. When you look back at the, you know, the journey with Florida Capital Partners, what, what do you think are some of like the key takeaways for entrepreneurs, you know, who are starting their businesses? Um, whether it's, you know, they want to start their own M&A advisory firm, they want to do their own independent sponsor model, then they go down that route to start a funded sponsor. Like, you know, what are the lessons learned here on, you know, your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, well, I, I just think um, a theme I'd lift up is just the importance of identifying a niche. It's just, just like the companies that we invest in. We don't want to invest in commoditized companies that have no differentiators. Uh, they win by having the lowest price. I mean, they're just really commoditized. The same is true for us. I mean, I, I think that anybody um, in, in M&A or something tangentially related, we have to find the right niche. We have to find the right differentiators. We have to find a reason um, why someone should think of us instead of you know, the large numbers of, of would-be competitors. And, and, and also, I think for any entrepreneur in any industry, it's all about people. So it's it's thinking about you know, really what you want to build, um, what you want to build culturally, and then be very, very protective of, of those, um, those core principles as you bring people onto the team. I, it, I think it's very difficult to, um, to fix broken culture. So if you're going to build it, build it right from the very start and, and, and be, be thoughtful about it. How have you guys done that at Mangrove? Like, what's the what's the Mangrove story, and like, how do you think about principles? You know, a lot of people discuss them as being very high level ideas with not a lot of bite on it, not a lot of specificity. But like, what does that actually mean to your team with yeah. culture? How do you guys um, kind of think about it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, first off, it it is real and it is important to us. It's not something that we think about or that we codified um, because we thought it would look good, you know, in an LP presentation or, or on a website. We didn't have to um, to come up with them and then try to become them. Rather, um, you know, sort of plumber's pipes. We really want to be doing our strategic planning. Really want to be mindful of, about these important things internally. So we, we had a, a session or we've had, we've had sessions of strategic planning. And, and part of it was, you know, early on, let's discover who, who are we and, and what are our core values? So we didn't have to make anything up, you know, uh, they came very quickly and as it should be with everybody, like the first one has to do with integrity. Um, but then for us, it, it goes beyond that. And intellectual curiosity was an, an important part of it. Uh, another part of it is uh, life not being a zero sum game. Um, and, and what that means to us is that we want other people to do well. We want our younger people to thrive and do well. We want our partners in the portfolio companies to do well. We want our intermediary partners to do well. Um, so if, if you're so busy, if you're so goes kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier, if you're so obsessed with the last dollar, if you're so obsessed with getting rich and maybe getting rich quick, um, then uh, I, I think you're at risk of, of failing to really live uh, a work life where life is not a zero sum game. And we Do think you that's think that, important. I think that's the nature of true partnership. 
do you think, let's dive deeper in that zero sum. Do you think that people who do play zero sum games in our industry are, if you're to look at the data, people who play that way are materially wealthier and what do you think will be the difference in your life satisfaction and happiness if you did play other ways versus what you do now? Right. Um, I, I think there are examples and yes, they can be a little bit frustrating examples of people who are not particularly good partners or they're not particularly virtuous people and they can do extraordinarily well economically. Um, and if you look at some of the decisions that are made, it's, it's very clear. Um, I, I do think these things do become very clear if you really spend time with people and you look at, at, at the decisions and the behaviors. Um, but it's not much we can do about that. All we can do is take care of, of ourselves. And, and for us, we know to a person that we would not be remotely happy um, if we made any decisions that weren't in keeping with our, our core principles. Um, I mean, the success comes, and we're fortunate to work in an industry where if you do really good work uh, and if you really are an effective and a very good partner to everyone that you deal with, you, you should be able to put you know, food on the table. Well, maybe that was the wrong question for me to ask. And maybe the more appropriate question is like, how, how do you define success and happy? In happiness in your life, you know, looking back on your 30 plus year career, what, you know, why do you think you have had a successful career, if you do believe that, and more broadly speaking, outside of just the one dimension of financial success? Yeah, I, I think we have been successful. And, and the way we measure it is, you know, have we done a really good job for all of our constituents? Um, have we done a really good job for the limited partners? Have we done what we say we are going to do? Have we performed? Uh, and then how did we get there? Um, did we get there um, by behaving in, in accordance with our core principles of being a really, really good partner to company owners and operators and their people throughout the organization? Um, have we been really good to lenders, or, you know, to all the people that we touch? And I, I can state with confidence and, and some measure of pride that, that our team, our teams have. And so we don't care. We don't care so much about you know, you know um, making hundreds of millions of dollars. Sort of, I mean, we're not we're not interested in, in becoming uber rich. I mean, we're commercial creatures, but we're, we are not um, going to sully our principles uh, or our strategy um, to accomplish that. We really enjoy doing an excellent job. And, and those two things don't always um, coincide with each other. You know, size and, and vast riches and doing a, a really good job. Well, let's dive deeper into some of those principles because I think the stories, I think there are often stories that lead up to those principles to kind of either create or reinforce those. So like when you look at in, integrity, Right. Why is, yes, we understand it's, it's a, why that is a core principle. A lot of people have that, but what are maybe your personal stories or the firm's stories that have kind of led up to that being a core principle of the four that you listed? Yeah, I just think, I think it was inherently in the people that we sort of just organically were attracted to, to bring on in the team. It's sort of a natural mutual selection process of you know, people that you get a very strong sense or your extensive work together evidences that they, they do have that solid foundation and that you can trust each other. And then we can you know, sort of corporately uh, extend core principles to everybody we deal with. What about um, the team? Like you're talking a lot about the culture of the team. How's it, how have you guys thought about building and constructing a, a unique team? Yeah, let me, let me share with you a little bit about why we formed Mangrove and, and, and that will, I think, launch nicely into, into how we're built and, and what the team is about. So we, uh, as discussed, we had uh, six successful funds at Florida Capital Partners. My two original partners had retired um, very early on in the existence of Florida Capital Partners. Um, I was lucky to win an internal argument um, regarding the importance of having internal operating 
capabilities, internal operating partners to be a better partner, which again was a, a core goal, right? Um, not, not just to make money, but you, if the industry makes a promise to be able to be materially helpful to entrepreneurial companies in the lower middle market, these are often uh, companies that really could use some help to break through an inflection point, to round out their team, to professionalize, to accomplish the things that they wanna accomplish. But if we didn't have serial CEOs, COOs, CFOs on the team or people that had done it and people who can do it, if we're nothing but a group of uh, well-intending numbers people and, and deal people, then I think that promise is hollow. And I think that generally was the case uh, in the early 90s. Um, you know, an FCP had a few years under the belt. And um, so we fixed that. And I was very lucky to know a, a gentleman that was perfect um, to lead that internal operating charge. And, and Matt Young, who's one of my co-founders from Angrove. And he came uh, into our shop with some fellows that had done some great work with him. Uh, Roger Bates, who is a second generation Deming disciple and a manufacturing business process wonderkind and a culture guru. Uh, and, and Barry Cortice, who was a, a great serial CFO. So we saw what those guys could do um, at FCP over a course of, of a couple funds, both playing defense for portfolio companies with portfolio companies, and then also playing offense. And it, it was important to us to create Mangrove um, to really um, allow those guys to do all that they're capable of doing. Um, not only putting out fires, but also um, working really well um, with these operating companies in every, every aspect of, of defense and, and offense. What I underestimated was how important and effective they are in winning the opportunities in the first place. I didn't honestly think about that, but in reality, uh, it is a very different dialogue when, when we sit down with internal operating partners uh, in, uh, at the table too, with an owner operator. It's an operator op operator to operator dialogue. Sometimes it's engineer to engineer. And the genuine enthusiasm for entrepreneurial business, the genuine enthusiasm and understanding of, of how a plant works, how machines work, um, how the decision-making uh, goes for an entrepreneur. Uh, it, it, is, it is fun and it's exciting. Uh, we, we get pulled aside in first company visits pretty frequently by the owners. And let's say that there have been a half dozen folks that have paraded through. Uh, one, I think they're, they're surprised and impressed with what internal operating guys know. And with the level of respect and just a, a, a camaraderie that is built, uh, trust and friendship that's built very, very quickly. How common do you think that model is within private equity right now? If you had to take a, a guess on what percentage of, let's say industrial focused sponsors have like legit full-time dedicated operating staff, what would be your, your guess? Certainly far more than there used to be. Um, both because I think people recognize its importance. It also could be impacted by the fact that the limited partner community also believes in it very strongly by and large, and, and they've started to, to ask for it. Um, boy, I, I couldn't guess at a, at a percentage, uh, Jordan, but, okay. uh, but you've it, seen a major trend in, in shifting towards it. Absolutely. And, and I do think also for a good reason, because it works, but I also think that, um, there is the possibility of lip service to it versus the reality of it. And, it. and it's not too hard to sort of divine which is the case just by looking at the team, looking at the backgrounds of those individuals to try to assess pretty quickly whether someone actually has the goods or not. Uh, and then look at, you know, what has been invested in that function. And at Mangro, we invested half the ownership in that ability to really drive and help build enduring value at portfolio companies. Um, so we clearly live it. Um, I'll add a, a, as an aside, one of the really key things, I mean, for all the sophisticated tools that internal operating partners can have, 
um, maybe the most important tool is a human one because you could have the most sophisticated uh, operational tools that you could bring to bear in helping an entrepreneur grow his, uh, their business. But if you don't get enthusiastic buy-in, trust and friendship, um, if you don't have those human skills, uh, if you're overbearing, um, then it's just not going to work. It's a bigger question, which is like, why do you do what you do? You've been doing this for 30 years. What keeps you motivated? What's your why? Yeah, it's, it's great fun. Um, absolutely thrilled to learning about new industries. There's that intellectual curiosity vein in our culture. Uh, really love to learn about new industries, many esoteric niche industries. You may, didn't even know they existed. So you learn how stuff is made and how stuff is done. Um, it is great fun to, to get to meet and, and uh, learn about and learn from uh, very successful entrepreneurs, some of whom are the most successful in the country in their niche. Um, it's, it's great fun to win the day and actually be chosen um, to partner with someone to win that trust and deservedly so um, you know, when you have the operating oomph to, to, to help them. Um, I love um, watching those companies and helping those companies thrive, um, like seeing them grow, like seeing them be uh, able to employ more people. I love seeing our internal um, team develop and grow. I love seeing our young people um, earn the ability to take on more responsibility, uh, do really well, and then be rewarded for that. You know, when, when, you, when you look back at the career, what would you say have been some of the more difficult times that you have experienced and kind of how did you navigate those waters? Because I think a lot of people might be experiencing that right now, whether it's in their current path or they were forced into a very new path. It could be unemployed, but, you know, just what's your advice to people? And maybe if you could share a story about some difficult times you've been through and how you got through that. Sure. Um, from a work standpoint, I would have to say that um, once in a blue moon and, and after over 140 transactions, I suppose I should expect it. And frankly, in, in private equity, you should always expect the unexpected <laughs> because the craziest things can and do happen. Um, but there have been a couple instances where, despite um, great efforts, um, we've run into the buzzsaw of people that were dishonest and were really good at it. Um, like there is a certain personality type, I imagine, a certain pathology, which allows people to be extraordinarily clever about, um, you know, just doing, doing you wrong. Uh, whether it was um, company owners that were dishonest and violated agreements and really never had any intentions of doing the right thing. Um, that's disappointing. Um, when in, in happily, I, I count on one hand, the, the times when portfolio companies um, didn't do well at all. Uh, the industry, for example, may have really hit a m massive dislocation. Um, that's, that's very disheartening. Um, we, we don't want that for our limited partners. Uh, we don't want that for the companies and, and their people, um, but it, it, it's happened a couple times. Um, you know, in, in all of these cases, um, you just perseverance has to be a core characteristic if we're going to be successful and if we're going to continue to enjoy what we're doing. I had a young person one time surprise me by saying, you're unflappable. And I go, like, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you know, these horrible things can happen. And, and there's some small things too. We, we just, for example, you know, recently had a strategic suitor disappear, you know, the week of closing and there weren't particularly good reasons, you know, for it. Um, and, you know, it, it just comes with the territory. Um, you, take, you take the good with the bad and you just keep plugging along. Uh, and, and being a team is a nice thing. You know, you can commiserate uh, and, and go on to the next. We know that if we just keep keep the oars in the water, keep our backs to the oars, you know, we're, we're going to keep moving the boat. The, that theme of, of perseverance uh, is incredibly important. If you to think about the characteristics 
that are going to, you know, portend success for anybody. I remember when, when I, we first raised our first diversified fund, you know, uh, uh, back in 1990, 91, uh, for Florida Capital Partners, um, being young and naive, I, I thought, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to read the Forbes 500. I'm going to read about these people that are wildly successful, and I'm going to land some of them as limited partners. Turns out that, you know, years later, I <laughs> probably ended up doing that, but not because I was reading, uh, reading about these individuals in a magazine. And I, I do remember being completely struck by common characteristics for people that did extraordinary things in business um, who weren't given you know, the, the business. Um, and the one common characteristics, characteristic was perseverance. They would start something and it would fail. They'd start something else and it would fail. And they'd start something and it became Dell computers. You know, it, those stories uh, repeated over and over and over again. And Clearly, you, you don't want to, you know, invest good money after bad. You don't want to push a rope indefinitely. But if, if in your gut you know that you have found a great niche, if in your gut you know um, that there are differentiators and you have the ability and your team has the ability to execute and win, then, you know, you should let nothing stop you. And, and so what's that balance between that concept of that dog doggedness of just I am going to do this path, come hell or high water. Balancing that and having the conviction that you're mentioning with the the niche, the team, et cetera, with the other side is like almost the objective perspective, like, listen, you've tried this, move on. Yeah. Like, how do you balance those competing uh, dynamics of perseverance versus delusion? Yeah, I, I do think that if one is a pragmatist, one would probably have to set some kind of a, of a, of a time frame on it. Um, I, I have one lim wonderful limited partner who comes to mind and, and he is a fantastically successful human being and, and also businessman. And his dream you know, growing up in, in, uh, in rural Kansas was to be an actor and to be a musician professionally. And, uh, you know, he was pursuing that. He took some business classes uh, for plan B. So he did have a plan B. And uh, he pursued that for years, didn't quite pan out. And he became the largest franchisee in the history of US business uh, and became a billionaire. Uh, never losing, by the way, uh, his humility and just being a terrific guy. So uh, when he had that success, guess what he did? He went to plan A. And he, he, uh, he built or bought uh, theaters. He, uh, he uh, produced USO shows. He got back to his passion thereafter. Um, but, but you know, to answer the question simply, I, I just imagine there's got to be some fuse um, to something um, of a period of time in which you're going to test the viability of, of your idea or of, of your ability to, to make, it, make it work. That that makes me think about something my wife did quite well, which is give me a time limit for raising money for my first business, yeah. and also a second time limit for, uh, you know, first dollars in the bank, and that time bound thing because entrepreneurs tend to you have to be optimistic, and it's having to balance that optimism with, you know, the reality plus the other constituents in your life, your family, your business partners, your investors. Yeah, tough to balance that. Yeah, well, balance is another you know <laughs> universal tenet of of I guess living well and life. I mean, um, entrepreneurs are fantastically optimistic, and sometimes what that can lead some individuals to do is to believe that every idea is going to work, which can lead to a less than focused strategy. They're not focused on the vital few things, the things that are going to really move the needle, or necessarily be successful and. Um, they can spend a lot of time and energy and treasure, you know, pursuing things that, that aren't working out. So there's an interesting balance um, that we find when we partner with entrepreneurs in that you've got that incredible engine um, for moving forward. But if you marry that with, um, with disciplines um, and with perspective, having been in a lot of different industries and understanding the importance of, of really solid strategic planning, and then really good execution, you know, some really good things can happen. 
what do you think, what do you think are some of the um, best choices that have really shaped your life? We talked um, about the hard times, the difficult times. Now let's talk about some of the good times. Yeah. <laughs> Back I, to I, sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, this is going to be almost a, a universal answer, I, I hope anyway, but certainly getting married and having children is, is the, the best thing um, that, that, uh, that I've, I've had happen in, in my life. Uh, one of my sisters put it really well about kids. She said that, you know, you, you think you know what love is but this creature is going to emerge that you don't even know. And you are then going to know what love is. And, and for me, um, you know, extends that experience and that enrichment um, extends beyond just our kids and ex extends to, you know, all people that flipping that switch, that capacity to love um, that you learn through having kids, I think uh, at its best can really extend to an awful lot of people that you're going to encounter. All right, now I need to divide this into two covers, two parts of that question. So number one is how how many years have you been married? Ah, yeah, uh, we've been married for uh, 25 years. And, you know, looking back on how you have managed a career with the family, you know, how have you, you know, maybe evolved as a husband and a partner? Because mm -hmm. I'm, every year my wife and I have our annual review. <laughs> and see if we can renew the contract <laughs> yeah. and i get a lot of feedback and it is 99.9 percent .9 accurate um so i want to learn like how have you done this right what can i learn from yeah well i i'm not gonna pretend to you know have any wisdom but um you know i, I do think that one it, it, i'm very lucky to have um an awful lot of support um you know in terms of of my wife and and then also i think that our team is very uh, supportive and that one of our, our cultural um, strengths is uh, work-life integration. Hmm. And you, we use the word integration intentionally because it doesn't mean that you're not going to be working, you know, late into the night and the weekends. Uh, you might, but similarly, when your family needs you, when there's something that you should participate in, um, then we have the flexibility to cover each other's backs to ensure that you, you, you can have a good family life, which is essential. I mean, we want to work hard. We want to work well, but we also want everybody to be happy. We want to be happy. And that's an integral part of it. It's the point about support, I think is really important because I think, you know, specifically when I was looking at the first two years of my four-year entrepreneurial journey, I was not supportive as I needed to be for my wife. It was, I'm off in startup land. I rarely come home. Can you take care of the kids with our, you know, your mom and dad who are here from China for, you know, three months at a time. But I forgot, I didn't forget. I was just absent and I was not supportive. And then that was really a big strain. And I had to realize like what support meant. And part of it now is like supporting her dreams. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not about me. And we needed that for a period of time just to get this one business, just to start it. But then it's just like, oh yeah, you know, there are two people in this. Yeah. You have dreams too. What are yours? I haven't asked in a while. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about being a, uh, like, what can I do as a father? I have a one-year-old and a four-year-old. Like, what are some of the things that, you know, I need to keep front of mind? Yeah. Um, I think one-on-one -on -one time is really essential. It's really important. Um, and, uh, you know, my 91-year-old mother, who's a mother of six, uh, shares a, a bromide that things come out in the wash. So sweating little things, you know, may not be very important. Um, but But certainly being intentional about you know, teaching them about the important things is, is obviously our job. Um, and understand that uh, going back to ain't no dress rehearsal, man, it, it, it's a cliche, but it does fly by. So uh, if we ever wondering, do I want to read that one incremental bedtime story? Yeah, you do. <laughs> God, I need to hear that. <laughs> oh that's been happening recently like oh no you did this so we're not going to read a bedtime story yeah and the other thing that every, you know everyone hears and, and i just think it's very true is that 
our kids are not in our mold. They're, they're absolutely born individuals and we need to cater and, and develop and love that individuality. They are their own people and they're going to be their own people. So, you know, sometimes in the margins, we may tend to try to push them in a certain direction beyond, you know, core values and things. And, and um, you know, I don't, I don't think that's positive. That's interesting because I was, my wife and I were talking about that, like, is it 50-50? Like, who's more like you? And then we forgot, like, oh, well, maybe there's another part of this pie. Like, maybe it's 50% them. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a low percentage. <laughs> I mean, what, what, Talking about an, ex, an experienced dad of a one-year-old, a four-year-old here. <laughs> well, you're almost guaranteed to get a mixed bag. And, and so, you know, you look at that and you say, no, they're not in my mold. They're not in her mold. Or you may have to go to a previous generation and you, you may never figure out, you know, where they come from. They're, they're just themselves. We have to let them. What, what do you think is some of the advice that you would have to like the 21 year old version of yourself? Mm, yeah. Um, I would say that finding the niche of what you really want to do, because I think it's really important to love what you do is incredibly difficult. But if you do see it and if in your gut as I was lucky to stumble into, you know, the private equity, then do whatever it takes to get there if you can. Um, what if we, how long did it take for you to really find that niche so that you could commit to it? Well, I think and a lot when of people did you take, know? Um, as soon as I found out what private equity was, I, I knew that that was the exciting, um, fun, gainful thing that I, you know, I, I wanted to pursue. Um, is everything about it. This is, we addressed earlier, you know, just the, the variety of it, learning about the different industries. I just knew, but my point is that, you know, if, if you are fortunate enough to light on, on what that thing is, and you have the ability to go to heroics, um, sacrifice to get in there, to figure out how, how you can, I, I think that's worth it. And if, if you're not loving what you're doing, then I, I, I life short, I, I would hope people could find a way to something that they really do enjoy. You know, I, I remember um, in my first job, uh, something um, that really struck me, you know, hopefully young people, hopefully I was respectful. Hopefully I still am respectful. But I do remember really being taken aback. I, I assumed that the adults in the room really knew exactly what they were doing and, and they knew how to do it best. But, you know, I, I think young people um, should have their eyes open to the possibility that maybe it's not being done optimally and, and there may be a better way and think independently and, and try to come up with that better way. And, and perhaps making a practice of doing that again, while being respectful uh, and maybe it's internal, um, but um, you know, if you're doing that, then maybe that's how you discover a niche or a, a differentiator in an industry that creates your own opportunity, maybe an entrepreneurial opportunity. Maybe on a similar vein for the BD professionals who are just getting started, mm -hmm. what advice do you have for them when you literally created the industry, the profession within private equity. Right. Many people, if we were to do a vote, would call you the, the original. <laughs> so you are a, the authority on this. So I mean, what advice do you have for BD professionals out there who are just getting started? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's uh, kind of beating that same tambourine about being deliberate about figuring out what are the differentiators. And if you don't have it, then maybe you need to become part of, of the, the strategic plan, you know, figure out, okay, how, how can we differentiate? We kind of need to. So really figuring out what are you selling? You know, what are the differentiators? Um, and, and communicate those frequently, uh, communicate that widely and communicate that well and try to do it in a, in a memorable way. Um, and the glue for it is relationships. So, you know, uh, you, you use data, you use um, a, a wide net and frequency, but 
really having those relationships um, are going to make it stick. I think my key takeaway from, or one of my many key takeaways from this is just the importance of finding your niche mm -hmm. and just how to be different, being different, not for the sake of it, but because it is something that not just stands out from competition, but also I think leads to general happiness in life because mm -hmm. you find so much depth once you find that niche mm -hmm. where so much happiness fulfillment comes from. Yeah, something you believe in and um, something that you can you can execute on. Glenn, this has been awesome. <laughs> this has been awesome. I'm probably going to think of about a thousand more questions, so this might be part one of part yeah. ten. <laughs> but you're you're going to ask about uh, books, and there's there is a book. Um, I, I couldn't lift up a favorite book. Um, yeah, that, that's impossible for me, especially given, as I mentioned, the, the breadth of of, of interest, but. Um, a recent favorite was uh, Shackleton's, it's, it's called Endurance, Shackleton's Incredible Voyage. Um, and the reason why I loved it was one, it's a really great adventure story. It is, it's fun and fascinating, but it really does inform a, a, an, an incredibly from a guy, you know, from so long ago, um, the kind of contemporary leadership um, methodologies and thinking. Uh, the importance of team, the importance of culture, the importance of perseverance. It's a, it's a fun tone. That reminds me of the ad that Shackleton put in the newspaper. And it was basically like men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, right. bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe Turn, safe return, doubtful, honor yeah. and recognition in case of success, yeah. Ernest Shackleton for so, Burling Street. <laughs> how bad were their lives to sign up for that? Yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and that goes just to the, the importance of, in, you know, perseverance. Um, oh, man, I, could, I, I, need to re, I need to reread that. Um, yeah, it was a great read. Back on the subject of books, I'm not going to let you off the subject of books. Um, you know, from a business book standpoint, really anything by Jim Collins. For a couple of reasons, um, you know, one is just the insights, uh, and and they seem to ring true to me. Uh, and the other is from a human standpoint, just that the sheer fact that the things that that Collins found empirically, you know, in his research, or more accurately, as graduate students found in their research. Um, really confirms the importance of being a servant leader. Um, and that's, that's something I, would, I would believe in much more strongly than people who want to lead through, you know, force of will or intimidation. I think that's interesting because it also makes me think about uh, something that's been very at the forefront of my mind recently, which is, you know, in you know, in the content that we do, having that mentality of how can this help somebody, either through education or through entertainment or some combination of that, as opposed to being me focused or us focused, like what is this doing for them? And that comes back into a servant mentality, but also for the team. And this is where I've had to think about leadership, which is, you know, when starting the business and earlier in your career, it, it tends to be all about you. And then it's like evolving from that into a leader. Mm -hmm. And just now how, like, what's the next best version of our team? And how can I help them, not just to have that discussion, but then bridge them from where they're at to where they want to be? You have to balance that with, you know, what you can afford, or what you can provide, because it's not infinite. Yeah. So there, there's that word balance again. But isn't, I mean, isn't that true? I, I, I clearly have to find the greatest book up there ever written about balance because it, it, it is a universal theme again, is, is balance. It, it, it applied to what we were just talking about in parenting. It applies to, to management. It applies to culture. Well, I, I think the, the balance paradigm, I don't, I wonder if that's the most appropriate one as opposed to what you're saying earlier with integration. Because so much of the balance is like, okay, I'm doing too much of this one day, and now I need to do this, as opposed to a different model and paradigm for thinking about life, which is, no, it's all intertwined. 
So it's something that I was, I was thinking about is we, we were talking about the importance of an internal operating capabilities and, and the power of them. You know, a couple of things that not many people talk about is the degree to which having internal operating capabilities, you know, having these people in your foxhole, if you're an owner operator and, and their team uh, is reducing risk. And maybe it, it should go without saying, but, but I don't think, again, that entrepreneurs, they, they're risk averse. Otherwise, otherwise they wouldn't be entrepreneurs. Um, but we, I've certainly seen um, uh, over and over again, the merits of the, the risk reduction that what the best practices and the things that my internal operating partners bring to an entrepreneurial business are about. It really does reduce risk. Um, from a sourcing standpoint, they really afford us the opportunity to look at things that aren't necessarily squeaky clean perfection. So we can look at something that is complex, but very opportune. And as our industry becomes more and more competitive, that's a valuable thing. And we can become more valuable to intermediaries um, because we can be a great home um, for a company that has headline risk. Um, but if, if it's in our DNA to roll up the sleeves, do the work, do the analytics, uh, find out what really is that, that risk associated with that industry or that company. And are there positives that far outweigh uh, that headline risk? And that headline risk may really not be a substantive risk. It could just be people's knee jerk reaction to a headline. Do you think that has been, you're able to more effectively assess opportunities because of niche operational expertise so you know very quickly yes i see the headline here i see the risk but here are the second or third level questions that we actually need to understand to assess this absolutely yeah or we just have to roll up the sleeves and, and dig in uh, i'll give you an example we were fortunate to invest in, in a company that was a husband and wife owned manufacturer of really high high quality um, crossbows well, a lot of people would say, my gosh, crossbows, is that like a buggy whip? You know, is, is, is that basically a, a, a tiny market and it, is it on the, in, the, in decline? And nobody seemed to um, light on the fact that state by state, state legislatures were starting to pass or thinking about passing first crossbow hunting seasons for deer beyond people that were old or infirmed. And doing so to one, make revenues from hunting licenses. And at that time, uh, states were particularly keen to raise revenue uh, in an economic downturn. And insurance companies pressuring because there are too many cars hitting deer. Um, and, but nobody seemed to know or care about that. And so you know, we saw great margins, we saw a great team, we saw a great product. Um, we saw an enthusiast following in, in that product category. And so we did the work. We just did a deal a couple of weeks ago, an industrial product manufacturer and service business. Actually, if we could rewind, crossbows? Yeah. yeah. How many crossbows are sold in the US in a given year? I've, I've uh, never thought of, I've, I don't think I've said the word crossbow or read that in probably right. the past 10 years. This lights on another important subject. Uh, you know, we're talking about internal culture. Um, we are very different people uh, at Mangrove in terms of, of our interests. We're the same with respect to, to ethics, um, to core principles and strategy, but we're very different in where we came from uh, and in what we do you know, recreationally. We have everything from a, a, a rabid you know, a hunter, fisherman, a few, few of us are, are, are rabid fishermen, um, but a, a, a former engineer operator. Okay? We have a recovered transactional attorney. Um, we have, as you know, we have a 23 year special forces military veteran. We have a lot of different interests, a lot of different backgrounds, and that diversity, there's real strength in it, as well as diversity in our skill sets from transactional attorney by background to engineer operator by, by background and so on. There's great strength in, in that jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> but I've been really thinking about that recently because I was like, 
does private actually private equity actually need to be diverse in its thinking as opposed to a venture mindset because the venture mindset by nature of what they're investing in they have to think contrarian they have to think different from the way the rest of the world works so they have to have that diverse team in order to find assess uh, successfully support entrepreneurs but i didn't know on the to what extent that was true and necessary for outsized returns within the buyout space because it's like okay we invest in industrials we know these operating procedures we know this industry we've run this playbook you know for the past 50 years etc you know how much tangential contrarian thinking is actually needed within the buyout space within the lower middle market for example and i don't have an answer it's more of a thought ex uh, experiment comparing to vc yeah i i, I can't contrast it to the vc world because I, I don't i don't know that world really but um, I think some some contrarian thinking or a willingness more so than contrarian a willingness to do the work to dig in deeper and to find those gems um, that aren't squeaky clean perfection but are very opportune and maybe feature uh, low lying fruit um, that the right team can capitalize on and that can really help for returns. Well, I I, I really like this because it's also just making me think about you know, taking a pause to assess, you know, and this is what entrepreneurs have to think about. What is everyone else afraid of because of headlines or whatever that you, know, you take a second or third level approach to it in terms of thinking, you find opportunities that others are not. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you have to, if it's going to be, if that's going to be in your comfort zone, you have to have the right people who are very, very good. At, at divining whether that complexity is you know, death in the making or, or low-lying fruit.